what I'm kind of focused on is what happens after the debt ceiling, because if they do successfully raise it, um, the treasury's already depleted their cash balance. They're, they're, they're nearly at zero. Uh, they don't really have any spare cash anymore. And so they have to go back to the debt market like they normally used to and issue more bonds in order to keep paying their bills. And they also want to refill their cash balance back up to their half a trillion dollar target, um, which basically means pulling liquidity out of the market, kind of like what the Fed's doing. And so the challenge there is if they do that too quickly um, or they do it with you know a lot of longer duration bonds, they risk pulling that liquidity out of the banking sector. A bill to temporarily raise the nation's debt ceiling was signed into law on Saturday by US President Joe Biden. All debt ceiling discussions will be put on hold until January 1, 2025 thanks to the bipartisan budget agreement, which will assist the U.S. escape its first-ever default. Biden made the announcement in a tweet on Saturday that said, I just signed into law a bipartisan budget agreement that prevents a first-ever default while decreasing the deficit, maintaining Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and meeting our solemn duty to our veterans. We are still working to develop the world's most robust economy. Less than 48 hours before Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, set a deadline for when to anticipate a financial crisis of global dimensions, Vice President Biden's announcement is a good development. When the U.S. debt ceiling was reached in January, Yellen offered several short-term ideas to assist the U.S. avoid a default, but she cautioned that they might only be effective for a few months. The U.S. was facing a catastrophic default if the debt ceiling was not lifted by June 5 of last month and the Treasury Secretary provided a more precise deadline after that. Lynn Alden, a well-known financial analyst, thinks it's not yet appropriate to celebrate the debt ceiling agreement even though it helps avoid the terrible effects of a default. Reputable analysts and investment strategists claim that the debt ceiling deal indicates the Treasury would start replenishing the Treasury general account, which it could have depleted during the past few months to assist the country in avoiding a default. The Treasury Department was acting in opposition to what the Federal Reserve was doing, which prevented the markets from being fully affected by the Fed's actions as the Fed was squeezing liquidity out of the economy, with its quantitative tightening measures. But things are about to change. The debt ceiling agreement, in Alden's opinion, means that the Fed and Treasury Department will both be draining the economy of liquidity. When we transition from a liquidity-neutral environment to a double-sided QD, the markets are certain to suffer. In a recent conversation with Stansberry Research, Alden talks about her forecasts for a future liquidity crisis. She provides specifics regarding her forecasts, the anticipated time frame, and the assets she will be purchasing when things start to fall apart. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable post notifications for more videos before we listen to Lynn Alden's professional analysis. The debt ceiling has been something I've been following ever since they technically ran into the debt ceiling back in January, right? So we've actually been in this period of multi-month period of the Treasury doing extraordinary measures to, you know, manage their cash. And so back then, my key theme was that liquidity is actually probably going to be pretty good for the next several months because the treasury was forced to basically push their cash into the market because they had to spend down their cash balance in order to keep paying their bills because they couldn't finance it with new debt and they didn't and their taxes don't cover it and so for for the you know pretty much the first half of this year um, the debt ceiling has ironically probably been constructive for markets because the federal reserve has, has been tightening this whole time and the treasury's basically been forced to offset that so you've had a neutral liquidity environment so i was like you know a lot of things are probably going to go sideways some things could go up and so i wasn't too um concerned with markets in general so it was it was a you know somewhat bullish thing but the point that i've been you know kind of concerned about for a while is that when the debt ceiling is actually resolved, ironically, um, the liquidity environment could change. And of course, this is based on what a handful of policymakers decide to do, uh, but it's something we have to navigate. What I'm kind of focused on is what happens after the debt ceiling, because if they do successfully raise it, um, the treasury's already depleted their cash balance. They're, they're, they're nearly at zero. Uh, they don't really have any spare cash anymore. And so they have to go back to the debt market like they normally used to and issue more bonds in order to keep paying their bills. And they also want to refill their cash balance back up to their half a trillion dollar target, um, which basically means pulling liquidity out of the market, kind of like what the Fed's doing. And so the challenge there is if they do that too quickly, 
um, or they do it with you know a lot of longer duration bonds, they risk pulling that liquidity out of the banking sector and they risk causing another round of, of bank liquidity problems, uh, failures, uh, messy treasury auctions, messy treasury market, illiquid treasury market in general. I, I think that's kind of the key risk. And also just negative liquidity environments are bad for most risk assets most of the time. Uh, or at least it's one of the big variables that affects kind of the multi-month performance of you know major asset classes. So part of the reason why the first half of 2022 was so bad for most asset prices was that liquidity was constantly going down because you had the Fed was no longer adding liquidity to the market. And back then the treasury was refilling its cash account from roughly zero after the prior debt ceiling issue. And so that was the particularly bad combination for liquidity. And we could repeat that again, but it's going to come down to what a handful of policymakers decide to do. How quickly do they want to fill that? What duration do they want to fill that? Are they going to be able to pull it out of reverse repos, which would be somewhat liquidity neutral or are they going to end up kind of messing it up and, and pulling it out of banks and causing a, a round of problems so you could see that um, you could also see kind of forced qe while still trying to hold rates tight um, one of the dynamics that we saw back in 2019 was the repo spike and back then you basically had a flood of t-bills come to market um, and there wasn't really a lot of excess bank reserves to kind of pull that out. And so you, you started to get dysfunctions uh, between bank lending. And so the Federal Reserve had to abruptly stop their quantitative tightening and go to doing quantitative easing, although they didn't want to call it that because they were only doing it with, with T-bills and they were only doing it for financial stability rather than as an intended form of stimulus. Um, so the reasons for it and the, and the specifics were a little bit different, but basically they, they, they kind of lost control of their balance sheet uh, temporarily um, due, to, due to actions by, you know, just overall liquidity and treasury decisions. Um, this one would be a little bit different because it's not, it's not that there's too many T-bills, it's that there might be too many, uh, you know, T-notes and T-bonds. Um, relative to cash to absorb it, relative to you know the money wants to stay in money markets. Um, and so I, I think you could see a similar dynamic. It's also kind of what happened back in March with the first round of bank uh, problems is that the, you know, the Fed didn't want to um, you know, provide that liquidity, but they were kind of forced to temporarily. They had to open up this new facility uh, and use a bunch of existing facilities to, to put at least temporary liquidity back in the market. And so you could see the Fed's hand forced um, if they were to break something seriously, like if the treasure market gets dysfunctional, um, if if you have another round of bank failures, um, if some of those kind of key markets freeze up again. I, I think this is mostly a six to 12 month story um, because this is specifically trying to refill the treasury account from an unusually low level, which really only it gets down to this level due to debt ceiling issues. Um, and we're also kind of skipping along kind of the minimum amount of liquidity that the banks can have. Uh, we kind of ran into that level back in March around the bank, um, you know, uh, crisis. Uh, specifically, the small and medium banks were kind of at their liquidity limit, um, and they got refilled a little bit because these these temporary Fed actions. Uh, but if we do another environment where, you know, the Treasury is now sucking liquidity back out, the Fed's still doing quantitative tightening, we could retest those liquidity limits and kind of get another round of this. So. Um, when we look longer term, it, it's different types of fundamentals that I would look towards. But uh, liquidity is what I look towards when I'm trying to figure what's going to happen in three, six, 12 months, or at least it's, it's, a, it's a big factor that I consider among some others. What type of moves do you make? So this would be primarily cash equivalents. So, I, you know, I've been using what I consider, a, I call a three pillar portfolio, which is kind of a different framework than the 6040. So basically one pillar is cash equivalents. It could be money markets, T-bills, cash in the bank, that kind of thing. Another pillar is just long-term uh, equities, generally profitable long-term compounding equities. Could be indices, could be individual stocks. Um, and then the third pillar is commodity plays, um, hard assets, infrastructure, hard monies, you know, gold, Bitcoin, things like that, that are more debasement hedges or inflation hedges. Um, you know, decent amount of energy exposure, for example. And each of those pillars defends or benefits from a certain type of environment. Um, and so should we get these, you know, the kind of the worst case scenario liquidity problems, uh, that's where the cash equivalents would really come in handy for, you know, reducing some downside volatility and allowing for a rebalancing uh, opportunity into some of the other more attractive long-term assets. 
So basically, so I, I manage the risk sorry. just by not being just not being fully invested at all times. Uh, basically, if I put you, your friends, or family, yourself, whoever you want to go with on an island for ten years, um, and you could take one investment, throw your phone in the ocean, and ignore about it. It could be the index, it could be a commodity, it could be whatever you want. Something where you feel you know next ten years, this is somewhere I really believe in to invest in. Probably Bitcoin. Uh, it's probably a decent way to finish it. I think the, um, it benefits. I think the network effect and the overall technology is still not understood, and I think it's still strengthening. Um, I think um, you know, as as other things happen, uh, you know, as AI makes certain things cheaper, um, any sort of you know scarce asset is attractive, um, and you know something that should hold its value long term and then like i said it's basically just i i think in many ways it's the future of money and so it, it's it's something that you know why you can never be 100% sure about um I, I think it's probably my number one investment theme what which asset would you trust to protect your investment for the next 10 years if you were asked to choose just one for the period of time will it be bitcoin one of the most popular cryptocurrencies or a totally distinct asset class please share your thoughts and views in the space provided below Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable post notifications so you never miss any of our regular uploads. Thank you for watching.